thank you guys for um, speaking up because you know I need you guys to say that so I know you're there. So today, something new and different. I'm here with Michael Shiashiko. Did I say that right? Uh, it's like shikashi, like pistachio. That's the easiest way to remember. Oh my god! <laughs> and what's so funny is I went online to find the pronunciation. <laughs> Good luck. Got it wrong because I've been saying it wrong all weekend. Gosh, shikashio. Yeah, there's like and three of us in the entire world. So <laughs> that's not a very common name. <laughs> Surprisingly, there are several Kimberly Gautiers out there, and one of them is a criminal. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but we are going to talk about aggression in dogs. So I know it's like I've been talking for weeks with Dr. Kozier, and it seems like most of our content is about nutrition or health. And I want to go in a completely different direction because there is a huge component of raising healthy dogs that we often overlook in our discussion, and that is behavior and training. And when you live with multiple dogs or just have one dog um it's amazing how many things you can resolve by just making sure that they get the training as you guys know i have two sets of litter mates rodrigo and sydney are 10 scout and zoe are six and i killed it in that but i only did it because i worked with dog trainers and so um michael i so appreciate you coming on with me today and i was hoping you could tell us you know, with all the different, I guess, niches that fall within dog training, what made you focus on aggression? I was doing a lot of um, uh, work with rescues and fostering dogs. So over the years, I had over 100 foster dogs come through my home. And uh, I started really wanting to, to help the dogs that had behavior issues because those were the dogs that were least likely to get adopted. Um, they would sometimes not be adoptable in some cases. So I really wanted to help focus on those dogs and um, because I felt that they needed the most help in terms of actually getting into a home. So that's kind of where I started. So we get some like minor aggression cases, but it just started getting a little bit more towards the more severe stuff over the years. So that's that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah. And what is, I guess, the most, I don't even know if this is even a legit question, but like the most common cause of aggression? in dogs you i would say one of the most common reasons is lack of socialization at an early stage so um dogs coming from puppy mills or things like that where there's there's a lack of exposure to things that they kind of need to get used to at an early age um, so that they're not afraid of those things later on i see that as a as a very significant issue and for those of us who do have dogs that have aggressive tendencies, so maybe they're, um, or like does reactivity fall in line with aggression? Well, it, it depends who you ask. <laughs> it's, a, it's one of those it depends questions. I, you know, I don't like to actually label dogs as reactive or aggressive. I just, I prefer just to look at their behavior. So somebody might get in contact with me, they, they might, my dog is a reactive. Well, I'll say, what is the dog doing? And then they'll say, well, he's barking and lunging at other dogs on leash that's giving me much more information to go on. So I'll ask more about the behaviors of the dog growling. It says the dog bitten anybody. Um, you know, what does the behavior look like rather than calling the dog aggressive? I think that can uh, carry issues with it too when you start putting things into a certain category, yeah. so. I 100% I agree. I have a reactive dog, Rodrigo, he's my first. Um, we adopted his sister like a couple days later and um, when they were eight weeks old. And I think with the mistake that I made with four of our dogs, four of our five dogs was not getting um, socialization or not really understanding what socialization meant. You know, I thought that just um, walking my dogs around the park and then when they were old enough and got clearance from the vet, taking them to the dog park and boom, they're socialized. And, um, you know, with Scout and Zoe, by the time they came into our family, we swore off dog parks. And so, but I thought Scout and Zoe would be socialized because we already had Rodrigo and Sydney. Mm -hmm. And um, so what is socialization and how do we go about socializing our dogs? So I think the common misconception about socialization is just exposing the dog to everything. So get them out there and, you know, and just, just get, try to get them to see everything, every kind of sight sound out there. So the issue with that though, is some dogs might have some tendency to be fearful of those things. So we might overexpose the dog. So let's say we have a puppy that's somewhat fearful or has like these fearful tendencies and we go to like Home Depot and we just started passing the dog around to every scary person. That's <laughs> actually uh, something called flooding where it's overwhelming for the dog where it actually becomes more afraid. Despite our best interest, we're trying, we're just trying to help the dog and, and socialize it, but it can be overwhelming for some dogs. So good socialization is gradual exposure to those things 
and pairing it with something positive happening if we can. So if you see a, there's a somebody coming with a bike, that means the treats are about to happen yeah. and we're gonna keep you at a distance where you can notice that thing and still feel safe, but uh, where again, it's gradual exposure. So you can do those things with a puppy uh, you know, at an early age and also avoid the risks that uh, a lot of veterinarians worry about is exposure to uh, germs when the dog's yeah. and not fully vaccinated. So you don't have to go in the dog park with a nine week old puppy. You can stay at a distance so the dog can observe the, or the puppy can observe the other dogs and those kind of stimuli. And that can go a long way to just gradual exposure to many, many different things. Uh, so there's, there's this hundred people in a hundred days rule that, that often applies. Right. You know, I um, years ago, I spoke with someone at the New York um, ASPCA. And one thing they told me is that they will put their puppies in a stroller and just walk them around the city because yep. then they're hearing sirens. They're having the smells. They're seeing the people. They don't allow people. The stroller's covered so people can't come and handle the puppies. Mm -hmm. But people do see them. And, and it just makes it a little bit better for the dogs. And, and it's funny because I wish I would have remembered that when we had Scout and Zoe, because I I did not do any of these things. I took them to like puppy class at PetSmart. You know, I did I did the best that I could without doing enough. I don't think. I mean, um, so they do have some fear issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whenever they see something new, like we live in a rural area, so one of my dogs freaks out when he sees a horse, and it's just <laughs> sort of like. So my next question is. When you have a dog, because I, I hear what you're saying about flooding, um, some people will try and just sort of force a dog to face their fears, I guess, sort of like with mm -hmm. a kid. It's like, you know, we're just gonna take away the nightlight and you're just gonna deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, how effective is something like that? Or is that just gonna make it worse? It doesn't depend. Yeah. It can often make it worse uh, because usually what we're doing as, as trainers and behavior consultants, we're, we're looking to do a process of what's something called desensitization. That's a slow and gradual exposure to something that uh, an animal is scared of or has a negative association with. So it's gradually, you know, so you might work with a dog that uh, has issues with other dogs. You might start 100 yards away at first and gradually decrease distance over time. The opposite of that is something called sensitization, which is when you're exposing the dog at such a scary uh, level that it actually makes it much worse. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the common analogy people use is spiders. A lot of people are afraid of spiders. So if I'm gonna desensitize somebody to a spider, I'm going to sh maybe show them a picture from across the room right. uh, as the first step, not to dump a box of spiders I mean, over their head. That's exactly right. get, get used to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was exactly what I thought. <laughs> so, For me, it would be snakes. It would just be like the yeah. whole scene in Indiana Jones when he drops into the pit. Oh. <laughs> So there's, there's a very low likelihood of you getting used to snakes by doing that, right? Yeah. Most of the time it's gonna make things much worse. So um, it's, yeah, it's the, there's that's why gradual is a slow and steady always wins the race when it comes right. to changing behavior in associations with dogs. And that brings to mind, someone mentioned, um, Jean mentioned the fireworks because 4th of July is coming up. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we won't really have that many fireworks with COVID, but I'm sure we will. Um, one thing that I started doing with my dogs is because they usually um, start, pra I say, practicing for the 4th of July a mm -hmm. month ahead of time. And um, I will just have my dogs outside and I don't react to the noise. And um, I've noticed that this works really well with four of my dogs. With Rodrigo, he's the worst. And he will just look to me and um, mm -hmm. I just don't react. I don't treat him. I don't do anything. I just, because my biggest mistake when he was younger was that I would be like, oh my God, it's a scary noise and then hug him and pet him. And so he started learning that, okay, if I, if I act fearful, then this is what I get. And it, now he shakes when there's fireworks. So is, are there things that we can do at home with our dogs um, to kind of help them? Yeah, so so contrary to popular belief, it's actually uh, uh, you can't reinforce an emotional response okay. with um, so like the, if the dog is fearful of something like fireworks, um, we can't make them more fearful by comforting them or giving them treats. Good. We can actually we can reinforce behavior or something that the dog does kind of uh, consciously. But let's say again, you you have I I you know box shows up to your house, it's full of snakes. And it's just it's open next to you. I say, don't worry, Kim. It's you know you're gonna be fine. Don't worry. You're not gonna be more fearful of the snakes if I do that, 
Or if I'm like, okay, it's going to be fine. We're going to let's move the box over here. Let's comfort you down. Let's let's relax. Take a deep breath. That's not going to make you more fearful of the snakes. Okay. So me comforting you is absolutely okay because you can do the same thing with dogs. They they're not going to become more fearful of the fireworks. So I think it's absolutely okay to comfort our dogs uh, and kind of take their lead. If a lot of dogs will want to seek out a safe space, like they some dogs want to just jump in the bathtub during thunderstorms, um, and let them do that. Like if they want that safe space, let them do that because. You're not going to make their fear worse doing that. Right. Um, so it's, yeah. And then if, if some dogs won't even take any treats during scary things like that, but if they want to take treats every time a firework goes off, if you start pairing treats with it, you mm -hmm. can sometimes change the association where they're like, wait a minute, every time one of those loud noises happens, I get a really juicy piece of hot dog or something, or whatever it is you're giving them. Sometimes I can, that's a, an effect called classical counter conditioning where you're pairing that with something. So it's the same thing as like when you go to the treat cabinet and open the bag of treats, the dog comes running over. Yeah. That's classical conditioning. They learn that sound. They don't know what it means until you do it a few times where they okay. learn that. When they hear the treat pouch opening, they, they know what's going to happen next. So you can kind of do the same thing with fireworks. So sometimes it's just so overwhelming because fireworks there's only there's usually only one level it's like it's yeah. not something we can gradually expose them to like other things so sometimes it's so scary that the food still won't help them so sometimes we have to look at other uh, things like like meds sometimes behavior meds can be helpful for those real extreme wow. cases because uh, again it's just so scary for those right. dogs right okay so i asked you to come on with me to talk about you know aggression in a multi-dog home and we have two 10 year olds, two six and a half year olds, and we have a one, a one and a half year old now. And, um, you know, there's five different personalities in the house. And our dogs actually, you know, we've had the fifth dog. He came to us. Um, he's my stepson's dog, and he came to us last summer. Um, and he's blended into the family, and everyone's actually doing really well now. But when it comes to dogs and, and basically their dynamics, my question is, how much do we allow them to just work it out for themselves? And how much do we try to maintain and um, control? That's a really great question. So there's, there's some variables you want to consider. So for younger dogs, we want to do a lot of um, kind of uh, supervising of their interactions as we go along, just like parenting. You know, So once a dog gets around two to two and a half years age, most breeds, they're reaching social maturity. So you'll see kind of the behavior sort of even out after that. So like if you have a young dog that's a one-year-old and kind of doing things that you can see aren't necessarily a problem yet. So no overt fights or anything like that, but you can see problems brewing there. That's when we want to intervene. Now, if you have a, a 10 year old and a six year old that have been living peacefully for years together and you see some grumbles, some growls, that's normal communication. Okay. You know, growling is a normal communication. It's used to actually avoid a conflict. So mm -hmm. I like growling in dogs because uh, number one, it means that they're telling me they might bite me versus going right to biting me. Right. Um, but it's good communication. So it's it's the same kind of communication if I said so, you know, hey, knock it off to somebody else when they're <laughs> doing something to me. It's communication that prevents the escalation to having to punch someone, right? So dogs the same. So. So with, with dogs kind of working it out, I guess it depends on how you define what that looks like. But if there's no overt complex and you see a little stare, or a little lip curl or a little growl, and the other dog's like, oh, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. Let's go on our separate ways. That's normal, I let that happen because that's yeah. good communication. But when you start seeing it escalate to fighting, uh, especially when there's injuries, that's something obviously that requires uh, you know intervention. Right, right. And one thing that, I've always wondered because there's so many different opinions about this is people will ask me because I have so many dogs, who's the alpha and <laughs> is there in a multi-dog home? Is there an alpha? Is that something that's true? And um, is, and is there like, cause we have a younger dog, is there going to be a point where he's going to like want to be alpha and try mm -hmm. and start fights to, you know, am I going to have to worry about this in the future? So, uh, so the alpha uh, concept has been mostly debunked. That came kind of from the wolf uh, study of wolves and um, some dog trainers started to pull that theory into dog training. So it started saying, oh, there's an alpha dog. 
but that alpha is referring to a, a family of wolves. Like you have the dad wolf is referred to as the alpha, but in dogs' homes, we're pulling in dogs not from the same family. Um, and they're, they're oftentimes many different dogs from different areas, from different families, and they're not, you know, so there's, there's no alpha per se in that kind of situation. Uh, what you can see though is dominant behavior. So not a, there's no such thing also as a dominant dog. Okay. Uh, it's just like saying, you know, Kim's funny. You're not funny all the time, right? You're funny sometimes, but at a funeral, you're not cracking jokes. Yeah. So it's not, so a dominant dog would assign that personality trait to them. And that's not true. There's no dog that's a dominant dog 100% of the time. Right. Dominant simply means priority access to a resource. So when two dogs are near, let's say a food bowl, and one dog goes, Err, and the other dog's like, oh, I'm sorry, you can have that. That dog is said to have the priority access to that food bowl. So it's dominant in that moment it's displayed a dominant behavior so but then it might go over to a toy and the other dog's like Err, and the other dog's like oh i'm sorry you can have the toy so that dog is dominant in that particular context mm -hmm. so um so it's not there's no like rigid hierarchy like top dog middle dog low dog it's it's it flows and in, in, in changes depending on the context mm -hmm. um so yeah and you know i guess you also have of course different personality traits and, and tendencies for fear or confidence. And I'm sure you see that with your own dogs. It's yeah. different personalities of what they might be fearful of. So uh, a lot of a lot of people might attribute that alpha dog is the most confident one or the one that's like got access to everything or it's like kind of policing the other dogs and all that stuff. But yeah, um, yeah we can we can do away with the alpha theory. Because okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what we we just sit there and look at our dogs yeah. and we're trying to figure it out. And it's like well, who's the alpha? And we actually have been having this conversation for 10 years <laughs> to figure out who's the alpha. Um, so I'm glad that we can just let that go. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Mary here says, um, do you have any tips for aggression coming in and out of the door? Mm -hmm. um, so good question, Mary. Um, so oftentimes at doorways, really any tight space, when you get dogs kind of bottlenecking into a tight space, they can create issues with just getting priority access. That's almost like competition over resource, like where they're trying to get access to the yard first or to meal times first or to the owner coming home. Uh, so teaching them what you want them to do instead. Um, so if you if you got the dogs, you know that they're all going to come charging out the door and that's going to create issues. Teach them all to wait and sit at the door first and then you let one at a time. And so you, let's say you have two dogs, you know, so like uh, Fido. I don't know anybody's dog named Fido, but I always use that word Fido <laughs> to describe a generic dog. I would say, you know, Fido, okay, your turn. And then, you know, uh, Baisley, your turn. And you let one out at a time. So it becomes much more controlled. And you just do that every single time. So that's why a lot of people don't have fights around the food balls because a lot of people will do that well. They manage feeding time really well. And you ask them why. So, well, I make this dog sit first. And sometimes they say, because I want to feed the alpha dog, but it's really just behavior. Yeah. So they'll make this dog sit first. They'll make that dog sit second. They'll feed that one first. They'll feed that one. And you do that twice a day, 365 days a year. So the dogs get really practiced in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So you can do the same thing at the doorway. If you just teach them, you know, teach them individually first so they get the routine or the idea of sitting, staying. Okay, you can go. Sit, wait. Okay, you can go. And then you put them together and start to add that in. And it, it works 99% of the time because the dogs just learn what to do instead of charging out and competing for that uh, access to that resource, whatever they're going for. And Mary, there is a really cool video on YouTube and I've seen it shared on Facebook. Yeah. It's like I'm a ton of dogs. Yeah. And they're just calling one dog at a time. And I'm just sort of, I'm staring at this like, wow, because that is yeah. not my house. I mean, but <laughs> going outside at my house yeah. is, is, I mean, everyone wants to go and, and we're just sort of like opening the door, like, please leave. Just get out, and we don't have um, we don't have aggression at the door. And now that you you know mentioning the um, you know the meal time, we do have a set pattern of feeding our dogs, and we know what order we feed them in. And even if my boyfriend's helping me feed the dogs, he knows to hold one dog's bowl until the dog three and four's bowl is set down and then mm -hmm. Apollo gets fed last and and everyone has space between them so we just we never have issues at meal time yep yeah. yeah. um gabrielle who now gabrielle <clears throat> this is what's interesting is gabrielle she's in australia and she works with dingoes okay and, um and so it's i get a kick out of following her because 
even though there's there's things that are similar to dogs, there are things that are very different. And she brought up, you know, about um, same sex aggression disorder. Mm -hmm. And I've heard about this with litter mates that someone told me, and I don't know if this is a myth or true, um, that if you're going to get litter mates, you should just get a boy and girl, because if you get two girls, you're gonna have aggression. But I know plenty of people who do have like sister litter mates with no mm -hmm. issues, so. Yeah, so the, um, what really the issue is, is that when they do start fighting, the female-female dynamic is more difficult to resolve. So it's, there's plenty of female pairings that live out there that are getting along just fine. And so it's it's not to say that when you get two females, they're going to start fighting. Um, or even if there's, it's not even saying there's a higher likelihood. It's just that it's much more difficult to resolve once they start having problems versus male-male or male-female pairings. Um, there's actually been a couple uh, kind of smaller sample size studies done looking at veterinary behavior uh, caseloads and the the success rate in female female pairings is right around 56 percent uh, in terms of what can be resolved and it gets into the 60 percent range when you're looking at uh, male 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 uh, male female pairings so but that's just a small percentage of it so all, all the other factors can come into play like the dog's ages the dog's breeds the dog's previous experience with other dogs why the dogs are fighting uh, the owner's involvement in it there's so many other variables to assess mm -hmm. other than just the sex pairing but okay. yeah um if you if the dogs if you want to avoid the most problems yeah it's, it's best to to get opposite sex pairings or two males interesting do they have any um idea of why it's difficult Lots of theories, but I've never seen any definitive research mm -hmm. done on it, um, other than just showing the statistics of, of the pairings. Um, you know, it's, yeah. it's one of those, you know, nobody's really studied it enough yet to say anything for sure. Kelly has a good question here. Um, she wants to know, is humping another dog a form of play? Um, generally speaking, no, because Humping can be a sexually motivated behavior, obviously. It can also be what's called the stress displacement behavior, mm -hmm. uh, where a dog is becomes over-aroused or stressed and starts, uh, you kind of sometimes see it when dogs start humping pillows or strange things like that, yeah. uh, or your leg. <laughs> um, sometimes we see it as they, they're, they're over-excited about somebody arriving and they can't control themselves. So it's like a, kind of like when people do this when they're kind of nervous or yeah. stressed or start tapping on something, dogs might uh, redirect some of that. Uh, nervous energy, so to speak, on in the form of humping. Um, it can also be a, when a dog is mounting another dog, it can be a, um, a what they call dominant behavior, where it is, um, you know, um, uh, kind of establishing uh, that in that moment. So you'll see those kind of behaviors like head over or arm go over the other dog's back or mounting, but um, so not generally not in, uh, in the context of play. Uh, and usually if it is, it's the, or the dog attempts that the other dog just wants to play, they'll spin around and be like, don't do that. Let's yeah. do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And should we be stopping that behavior? Um, only if it's uh, persistently bugging the other dog. Yeah. So if you see the other dogs trying to tell that dog, knock it off, because most dogs are pretty good about saying, you know, hey, yeah. I, don't, I don't I don't want that. <laughs> you know, Let's do something else. Yeah. And they spin around and they give a quick correction or a quick snarl or bark. And the other dog's like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, and that life goes on as normal in those dogs, but some are just persistent where they just keep mm -hmm. going after. So we have to go in and kind of play referee with those dogs and separate them or, or, or possibly even pair them up with a different dog. Right, right. And, um, you know, recently a friend of mine, uh, I work for or volunteer with a local rescue and she learned with her dog, she has fosters in and out all the time and one of her dogs, Graham Cracker. Mm -hmm. um, Graham is really good with puppies and new dogs and stuff, but you know, as he's matured, there are just some dogs he doesn't like. And um, so one of the things is I've always, it's not so much that I'm gonna force my dogs to get along with another dog, but I will, you know, correct my dog, you know, not to hurt them, but you know, I'm, you know, sort of like, no, knock it off if they're growling at another dog. and she learned that, you know, sometimes dogs just don't like each other. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And so in a situation, if our dog doesn't like another dog, um, besides just not having the other dog um, around, are there things we can do to basically comfort or um, just let our dogs know, okay, it's okay, and protect them from a situation that's causing them stress? 
Absolutely. I mean, it's we can take them out of that situation, especially if it's a, another dog they're not getting along with. It just just like people, you know, we we don't get along with everybody. We can't expect a person to get along with everybody, uh, and especially when a dog starts getting older, they're they're less likely to want to play. They might be having. Uh, you know, pain issues or arthritis starts kicking in. All those things that can make an older dog less likely to want to play. We need to be their advocate. So if I've got, you know, an 80 year old grandma and the grandkids are jumping all over, maybe she'll appreciate that for a few minutes, but then that's it. So it's, that's, yeah. there's the tolerance level. So same thing with dogs. We got to be their advocate. Okay. All right. That's, that's good. You, you, you've communicated, you don't want to be here. So let's go somewhere else. Let's just be their advocate and get them out of there uh, or manage the situation, you know, so they don't, they don't have to kind of keep, communicating because sometimes they do communicate to the other dog like knock it off i don't want to i don't want to i don't want anything to do with you yeah. and the other dog just keeps coming and so that's a good time to just interrupt and like say okay let's let's pick a different dog or let's get you out of this situation it's absolutely yeah. okay to do that yeah you know, one of the dogs he doesn't like is apollo our youngest and apollo's like bound and determined to make him mate love him. He's like, I'm going to be your best friend. And it's like, okay. So. <laughs> yeah. Stop trying so hard. Yeah. So it, you're like, you see how old a year and a half? Your a year, yeah. About a year. Yeah. And a half. yeah that's, that's a big age difference. A year and a half in a, in the 10 year old, I'm assuming you're talking about. I think, well, no, um, Graham, I don't know how old Graham is. I think Graham, I, I don't remember. I think he's about four or five years old. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but yeah, he's just yeah. a fan. He likes everyone else. He does not like Apollo, but Apollo is a lot to take. So one other question I do have, um, jumping. So I know that dogs, when they get super excited, they jump and we're kind of impressed because four of our dogs do not jump on people surprisingly, but, um, Apollo does jump on people. I have tried the turning my back. I've tried lifting my knee. I've tried ignoring him. Um, what are some ways to work with the dog? He's, you know, someone told me it's because of the husky in him, but I've seen plenty of huskies that don't jump on people. Yeah. Um, what can we do to help him stay calm? Is he's the half golden also? Yes. Okay, that's the golden side of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Um, yeah, so it's really the thing about turning your back, it can work for some dogs, but for some dogs, especially goldens, is that when you start doing that, it's actually almost inv inviting some more movements. The more you move with a lot of dogs, it's kind of when you think about like you want to get a dog running and chasing after you. What do you do? You kind of like turn and then kind of be like clap your hands and like just be silly. So when we start adding these movements, like we're going like back and forth like this, that's adding actually can be more inviting to the dog. So, um, so it's not that it doesn't work for some dogs. It's a good thing to try with some dogs because they learn quickly like, oh, I lose their attention if I jump up. Mm -hmm. So on the other side of the coin is teaching them what to do to get your attention or even getting something better than your attention sometimes. So often I'm using food to train dogs um, and teach them that if their four paws remain on the floor, they don't have to sit. They can sit if they want, but uh, just keep your four paws on the floor. Don't jump up. And that's on, that's where I'm going to either give you my attention or the treats. So, um, so it's important to teach them what you want them to do instead, rather than trying to uh, ignore the bad behavior. So like, you know, uh, turning away or, you know, even putting your knee into their chest or whatever, all those things don't teach the dog what to do instead. So okay. I focus a lot on, and it, and it can be, you know, it can be difficult at first because the dogs are so used to doing it. They've right. practiced it a bunch of times. So when you first start out, it's gotta be what's called a high rate of reinforcement. So um, you, you come over, you got the treats and you just one right after the on a rapid fire mm -hmm. and you walk over to another spot, he comes over a quick rapid fire treat there, you know, hand feed him right to his mouth, right at the level you want him to be at. Then you go over to another spot and see so he comes over. Each time he does that, you just keep re reinforcing that behavior and then you start to increase the duration in between each treat. And before you know it, the dog's like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay, I get it now. So yeah, teaching them. And then you just re you replace the treats with your attention because that's what he wants. Right. Treats get you there faster. But the, yeah. the attention maintains the behavior. The dog's like, oh, okay, if I want their attention, I just come over, keep my paws on the floor, and they'll pay attention to me. Awesome. So. And my final question is, as the humans, are there things that we're doing when we have multiple dogs? Are there things that we're doing or our behavior that is actually contributing to aggression in the home? There's quite a few things we could do as humans, unfortunately, that can contribute to aggression. Um, you know, one of the most common ones I see 
is something called resource guarding, where a dog will guard their food bowl or their toys, or they have an issue with um, somebody coming near their dog bed. Um, traditionally, the the advice online or some places you go to read is that you know stick your hands in their food bowl so they get used to it, or pet them while they're eating so they get used to it, or take the food bowl away so they know you own it, and all of those things. What happens over time is the dog just gets more aggravated. <laughs> it's like, you know, what, what are you doing? <laughs> just let me eat. And and then that can actually create resource guarding issues. Or if, or if the dog steals a sock, what do we do? We go, no, and we chase after the dog and then grab the sock and let them out of their mouth and be like, bad dog. And then what the dogs start to learn there is like, huh, that sock must have been really valuable. <laughs> so must be worth guarding. <laughs> so, so the, oh my God, it's like you're in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so it's and and you're not alone. Everybody, and that's such a common thing. A lot of people do is just just and, and it's it seems like uh, reasonable to do that because you're like, all right, that's what we're supposed to do. But um, if, again, if we think on the opposite side of the coin of how to prevent that, if we just think about how can we create a positive association for those things. So like the food ball. If I was just to walk over to the food ball and drop something of higher value in there and then walk away, and I just repeat that just every. A few times, every time the dog is eating over the course of a couple of weeks, what's going to happen? The dog's going to be like, there they, there they come again. That means something really good is about to happen, so please come on over while I'm eating versus please stay away because you're always annoying me while I'm eating. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's one of the most common ones. And then uh, sometimes when people are obviously um, being too rough with their dogs in terms of a punishment standpoint, so the dog does something they don't like and they use excessive punishment, that can often they say aggression and meets with aggression. So if you're aggressive with your dog in their mindset, they might uh, respond accordingly. That's another uh, common one I see. And I know this is along the lines of what um, you talk about a lot too, is, is um, you know, an interesting thing about stress and how that affects the gut, right? And how, and the back and forth, like, is it the chicken or egg thing? But a lot of things an owner might be doing that could be stressing out their dog can affect how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. which in terms of dog that's not feeling well is more likely to respond aggressively. Just like us as people, if we're not feeling well, we're going to be more grumpy. It's the same thing with dogs. I've seen that a lot where the stress is affecting their actual system. Mm -hmm. um, and then people think it's the food or vice versa. The food is causing the stress and then it causes the aggressive behavior. So yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's another big one too. And final question, you know, part two. <laughs> sure. Only because this is such a great point, resource guarding people. And, mm -hmm. you know, with five dogs, I there actually my dogs have gotten a lot better where I don't have them guarding me against each other. But, um, you know, when we first got Scout and Zoe, Rodrigo was very, you know, like, oh, she's mine to Scout and Zoe. And then when actually when Apollo joined our family, it was basically a back and forth between Rodrigo and Apollo, who I belong to. And um, I just actually wouldn't allow them to guard me. I would just move away. And um, but what are things that we can do to keep them from guarding us? So similar concept is that um, if we have uh, dogs, so I should define what resource guarding people is because there's a difference between resource guarding and owner protection. So mm -hmm. dogs that truly are protecting their owners. Uh, resource guarding is if they're worried about losing the owner's attention or proximity to the owner. Uh, owner protection is when the dog feels the owner is being threatened. So think like police protection dogs and those kind of dogs. If somebody's threatening the person, that's that's a different type of behavior than resource guarding of people. So resource guarding of a person, uh, dog, dogs are kind of competing over that attention. So say, very similar concept, just replace you with the food bowl. <laughs> so you're a resource. You're something that dogs find very valuable and it's worth competing over. And sometimes when one dog's closer to you and the other dog's approaching, it's like the other dog's approaching that dog's food bowl or their bone or whatever you want to replace it with. So um, so we have to, again, just like when during meal times you teach the dogs an alternative behavior that you want them to do in that particular context. A big one is you get home from work, the dogs are excited to see you and they're all kind of bumping each other out of the way what do we want the dogs to do instead? So a lot of times they will start bumping each other and then they then end up getting into a fight or once already there and the other dog's coming over and that dog that's next to you starts to go chase the other dog away. Um, so same thing, what do we want them to do instead? Now, if you guys want my attention, you need to sit there, you need to sit there. Mm -hmm. That's when I'll pay attention to you. That's when I'll pay attention to you. So they've learned this, what's called a desirable replacement behavior. 
in that context. So mm -hmm. it's not like they have to, you have to do this all day long or all the time. You're going to find certain contexts which they're more likely to compete over your attention because right. it's it's not happening most of the time. <laughs> it's not happening all day long. It's in certain contexts. So big one is uh, coming home from work. Another big one is when you're on the couch, kind of just hanging out, mm -hmm. and also on the bed when when you're if you allow your dogs in bed. There's some sometimes that one on one side and the other dog tries to jump up, and that's an issue for that dog. So just teach them what you want to do in those contexts. Give them direction and be like, you guys don't need to compete over me. Both get what you want, but just give me a behavior I like, which is just sit and relax. You can see the other dog coming in, but I want you to stay there and relax rather than going after the other dog. So that's in the minor cases. If it's a more severe case, you've got to put in some other steps, but uh, most cases of kind of the minor variety, you can, you can just do that and it makes a huge difference for the dogs. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you My so pleasure. much, Michael. This Thanks was for having me. great. I yeah, mean, great questions. Guys, thank you guys for joining us. And I am going to um, put Michael's website into the um, comments. And um, I'm also going to, you know, I think yeah, I already tagged up over his Facebook page. So Jeff, definitely check him out. And he's I was over obsessively watching YouTube videos <laughs> earlier today. So he's on YouTube as well. So definitely check him out. And I want to say thank you guys for joining me today. And thanks again, Michael. My pleasure. Thanks, guys, for joining us.